Hi, my name is Dominic and I have the privilege of serving as the adult ministries pastor here at Desert Hills. We just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in. We're praying that this sermon is a help to you, but also wanna remind you that watching a sermon online is not a replacement for your in-person involvement in a local church. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us at Desert Hills? You can do that through the app or online at deserthills.church. Again, we pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. The title of my message is Conquering the Strongholds. The ancient Phoenicians stood above all in their ability to navigate, traverse, and defend any location close to the sea. In fact, if you study the ancient Phoenicians, many people believe that the Phoenicians traveled as far west as Mesoamerica and as far east into what is known as modern day Japan. They would sail around the Horn of Africa and uh, they would go to what uh, we know as uh, uh, modern day Japan. They were unparalleled in their ability to build ships, have navies, defend ocean ports and fortresses. Now, they're mentioned in the Bible also helping King David, King Solomon uh, in the shipping of goods for the building of cities, buildings, and ultimately the original temple in Jerusalem. Their prowess on the seas could not be compared to anyone else. And their crown jewel was the unconquerable city of Tyre. In fact, here's a picture of what ancient Tyre would have looked like. You see some gates over here to the right that would have allowed uh, uh, ships to come in and go out at, into their safe harbor, and everything was protected by the sea. In fact, uh, no navy matched the ancient Phoenicians. They were better at warfare on the sea than anyone, any of, the, any of those in the ancient empires, the Babylonians, uh, the Greeks, uh, uh, those other empires, that would the Assyrians that would have came before, the Hittites, uh, uh, the Hevites all of those people, they, they outmatched anybody that came their way. And so Tyre was thought to be unconquerable. In fact, history tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar, when he was conquering the lands, it took him 13 years to try to conquer the city of Tyre. In fact, the Bible speaks about Tyre in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel gives a, a, a judgment, a prophecy of judgment against the city of Tyre and basically tells the city of Tyre because they were lifted up in pride and would not humble themselves before the true God, they were going to be destroyed. And, and history, as you study it out, a storm occurred that caused some damage and a fire occurred which caused some damage for Nebuchadnezzar to be able to go in and to conquer what seemingly was an unconquerable stronghold known as Tyre. Now history tells us of many physical, almost unconquerable strongholds. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Switzerland has been considered historically as an unconquerable nation. Uh, the, the Swiss people are trained in such a way that they have bunkers and supplies and ammunitions. Uh, uh, when, it, when World War I and World War II came about, uh, it was thought that the Germans were going to come in and try to conquer the Swiss. But from a young age all the way up to, to, to an older age, the Swiss are taught to handle and use a rifle, a bow and arrow, and they, they are taught to defend themselves. And they, they have still, even to this day, they have mines and, and explosives where if some nations go going to come in and try to conquer them. They'll close off the roads. They'll make it to where no one can come in and conquer them. There are many nations like that and many places in the world in his history that are considered unconquerable strongholds. Now, the city of Ephesus was a spiritual stronghold of darkness in the days of Paul. It boasted one of the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, the temple of Artemis, the temple of Diana of the Ephesians. This is what it would look like back in the days of Paul. Now, 
Not only was it a place of cultural significance, people would come and they would go to the Temple of Artemis just like you and I go to Disneyland or uh, go to the Parthenon or uh, the Areopagus in, in, uh, in Athens or some of these famous historical sites. Many people would go there for that. But not only that, it was a, a place of commerce. Most people believe, uh, historians believe that uh, the Temple of Artemis was the banking center of Asia Minor. It was a place of trade uh, there during those days in Asia Minor. And, and not only that, it was also a religious attraction. But not a religious attraction following the God of the Bible, but the false goddess Diana. Diana of the Ephesians. She was considered the goddess of the hunt. She was considered the goddess of fertility and the protector of those in the lower class. Blood sacrifices, sexual rituals of prostitution, and servitude were all a part of the worship of her. If you're to visit the ruins of Ephesus today, you would see the remnants that are left and how beholden the ancient Ephesians were to darkness and paganism. My wife and I had an opportunity to, to visit the ancient ruins of Ephesus here last year, and here's some of the pictures that, of things that we saw. This is, uh, this is the only thing that is left of the ancient temple of Artemis. This is it. You know, the Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell, <laughs> and all nations that forget God. Do you know the Bible says God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble? This is all that is left of one of the wonders of the ancient world. I mean, one of the places that many people would go to behold this thing, that's all that's left. Some more pictures. This is... Uh, Ephesus proper and one of the main roads here on the left hand side is the marble road and that uh, picture of that edifice in the, the foreground or top ground, is, excuse me, is the ancient library of Ephesus. Here's some more pictures uh, right at the front of the ancient library of Ephesus, uh, which uh, the library was considered to be the, uh, the second largest storehouse of books in ancient times, only second to Alexandria and Egypt. All of these things are temples and and shrines and remnants of temples or shrines. Another, uh, another temple here. Uh, we go on and here's another uh, uh, picture of the uh, library. There's my wife and I in front of the library. We're acting like we're smart, like we like to go to the library. And uh, this is a picture of uh, where they would do business and these little porticos are where they would actually do trade and commerce. Um, uh, this is the, uh, a little shrine dedicated to Ascalippus, uh, the god of medicine medicine, and uh, another shrine, a uh, temple, um, and then you see, uh, who knows what this is? The god Nike, right there, you know, your shoes, that's what this is, uh, this is about right here. But you don't have to look very far when you look at the remnants of what's left at Ephesus to understand that Ephesus was a stronghold of darkness. So how was Paul going to deal with this dark stronghold? Was electing a new ruler the way to scatter the darkness? I know what we got to do. Uh, okay, Christian friends, we got to go in there and we got to project our politics and we got to elect a new ruler and that is going to change Ephesus. Was that how to do it? Was starting a religious war to drive out evil from the hearts of men the way to do it? Was enacting laws that would ultimately change the habits of men the way to do it? No. You see, Paul understood that the light of the gospel needed to shine in order to quench the darkness that had taken hold of the hearts of men and women for years. So let me ask you a question this morning. What stronghold has a hold of you? Here's what James tells us in James chapter 1. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. But listen to this, 
verse 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, the fact of the matter is, every one of us have our own lust. We have that thing or things that is a problem for us. Now, some of you may have a problem with lust in general. Some of you may have a problem with anger. Some of you may have a problem with discouragement. Some of you may have a problem with any number of things, but the fact of the matter is the Bible makes it clear that everyone has their own lust, and when we allow that lust to cultivate, to ruminate in our heart, here's what the Bible says. It says, then lust when it hath conceived, we can understand this concept of conception. Every one of us were born, and we understand how that happened. There's an egg, there's a sperm, they join together, they're conceived, and then it takes on a life of its own. That's what lust is, and lust can do. Whatever our own lust is, it can breed a life of its own. And then it says this, it says, then lust, when it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, destruction. Now, the Bible speaks about also conquering the strongholds that we face. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. In other words, when that lust is trying to dominate our mind, when that lust is trying to enrapture, capture our heart, when that thought comes in, here's what we have to do. As the Bible says, it says, casting down imaginations. God, help me right now. God, I don't want to displease you with this thought or these series of thoughts that will lead to something that is not going to be edifying to you. So God, help me with my lust or help me with my anger or help me with my discouragement. God, help me right now. I'm casting down imaginations. And the Bible says, in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now maybe your problem is that you're trying to conquer your stronghold by your will. Your will, your self-discipline, by your own efforts and strength. But I want you to understand, you might be able to do that for a time, but you're not going to win the battle on your own. In fact, again, the Bible says we walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. And it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but they're mighty through God. You see, God does not want us to be captivated by strongholds. And this morning we see God using the ministry of the Apostle Paul to conquer the dark stronghold of Ephesus. And my prayer is that as we look at this narrative passage in the book of Acts, that God will help us to understand how we can defeat the dark strongholds that have taken root in our lives. Now, as we begin this morning, we see Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Now, Paul had just come off a successful teaching ministry in the city of Corinth. He has now traveled to the largest city in Asia Minor called Ephesus. And the Bible says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and we see Paul had a ministry of teaching. First of all, Paul enlightened the followers of John the Baptist. It says, he found certain disciples, verse 1, and he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto then what were you baptized? And they said unto him, unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So as Paul comes to Ephesus, 
Paul finds people who claim to be followers of God. Some believe that they were taught by Apollos who needed clarification regarding, in regarding the faith in Acts chapter 18. You see that back there. So Paul questions them and he says, have you received the Holy Ghost? They respond, we don't even know if there's a Holy Ghost. Then Paul asks them for clarification and they tell him they were baptized after the pattern of John the Baptist baptism. Now, the Jews during Jesus' time had come to a place where they were trusting in their works and their religious practices to save them. Their sacrifices, their offerings, and their prayers were all to be a reminder of the Messiah who would someday come and take away their sins. But during Jesus' time, uh, many of the Jews were trusting in what they could bring to God to save them. Now, when John the Baptist baptized people, his baptism was a baptism of repentance, demonstrating a change of mind and a change of heart, clarifying that they were no longer trusting in themselves, but the Messiah who would later come. John prepared the way for Jesus, and Paul explains this to these followers of John the Baptist and tells them, the Bible says, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is Christ. Now from the text, I get that these followers of John solidified in this moment that Christ was the only way to salvation, and the Bible tells us that they publicly identified with Jesus. It says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul lays hands on them. They receive the Holy Ghost. And remember, this is a transitional period. There were signs. There were wonders all given so that God would authenticate the ministry of the Christians and the apostles. And so God allowed some of that to happen. He allowed the miracle of tongues. He allowed other miracles. And the assumption is that other people believed when these followers of John spoke in languages as they were saved in the Bible tells us, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spank with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. Now, I want you to understand, I want to make this clear, people have always been saved the same way, by believing on Jesus Christ and him alone. Before Jesus came, they were looking back to the promises of the Messiah to be fulfilled who would save them. Now after Jesus has come, we look to the one who has already come and paid for the sins of mankind on the cross. Which brings me to a question. Have you genuinely been saved? The Bible makes it clear, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Jesus said it himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And many people will make you feel good, and they'll try to make others feel good, and they'll say, there are many roads that lead to God, and whichever road you, you choose, that will ultimately take you to God. No, the Bible makes it clear. There's one road that leads to God, and that road is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Paul taught the followers of John, and Paul reasoned in the synagogue. The Bible says, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, Paul's mode of operation when he arrived in a major metropolitan area was to start teaching in the synagogue where people had a knowledge of God and were waiting for the Messiah. Now, Paul was straightforward. The Bible tells us he disputed and persuaded in his presentation about Jesus for three months. He was dialoguing and communicating and trying to convince people that Jesus' kingdom was a kingdom of truth to be lived out in his followers and that Jesus was the only way to salvation. But the Bible says, but when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples. Now, uh, there were those in the synagogue who rejected Paul's message and said terrible things about Paul, and more importantly, they said terrible things about Jesus. So Paul left the synagogue, just as he did in Corinth, and he took those who had become genuine followers of Jesus with him, and the Bible tells us he was disputing daily in the school of one, Tyrenius. Now, the name Tyrenius is derived from the word tyrant. 
Now, most people believe that this name Tyrenius was given to this man by his students. And so, thus it was called the School of Tyrenius. Now, how many of you are in education? Any, any of you in here this morning that are in education? How many of your students think you're a tyrant? Uh, those of you that are in education. Okay, I got a couple here. I uh, got one. Uh, just, just you, Ophelia. Anybody else? Your students think you're a tyrant? I had a teacher in junior high, and uh, he uh, supposedly had a military background, but it turned out that uh, he had uh, stolen valor. <laughs> He did serve in the National Guard, but he only served for a couple of years, but everybody thought he was this Marine who had been in the Marines for years, and he was some drill sergeant, and he tried to project himself as such, and so you got into his classroom, and he, and he established his rules right off the bat, and, and he made it very clear that you couldn't leave the classroom to go to the bathroom. He said, if you have to go, just go right where you're at. I mean, is that type of teacher? You're not that type of teacher, are you? Okay, okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> but he was something else. And uh, his name was Jensen, and I, I won't tell you the name that we gave him as a student, but uh, we, at any time he turned his back, we were mocking him at every chance. He was a tyrant. Well, this guy, his school was called the School of Tyrenius. <laughs> now, Paul used this public, most likely rentable building to teach when it was not in use by Tyrrhenius. Now in Ephesus during this time, people would start working about uh, 6 or 7 a.m. and they would work until about 11 a.m. and then they would take a break, a siesta, as they still do in this part of the world until about 4 to 4.30 and then they would work again until about 8.30 to 9. Now Paul most likely rented this meeting space while the people were on siesta, and this allowed him an opportunity to catch the most people when they would be able to attend during most of them the four hours. And notice what the Bible says happened. And this continued by the space of two years so that all which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, Paul's ministry was so effective that almost everyone in Asia Minor was able to hear the truth that salvation could be found in Jesus. Now, now this doesn't mean that everyone in Asia Minor got saved, but for the most part, everyone knew about Jesus. And this place of darkness was being inundated by the light of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had an effective teaching ministry. Not only that, Paul had a ministry of miracles. The Bible tells us there were direct miracles, verse 11. It says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, in the Greek, the indication is that there were general miracles of which we're not told. Uh, most likely, people were being healed. Most likely, people were be demons were being cast out. And then the Bible says there were some indirect miracles. Notice what it says. It says, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So Paul, most likely, as he was teaching in the school of Tyrrhenius from the hours of 11 till about uh, 3 or 4 or so, before that, he was working as a tent maker. And as he was working as a tent maker, he would get a handkerchief and he would wipe the sweat off of his brow and off of his body. And, and he had an apron where he'd put his fasteners in and his nails in and the little rope that he'd use to build the tents and so on. And he would take those aprons off and exchange them for another apron. And most likely what was happening is people would come and they would get the handkerchief that Paul had used and they would take that handkerchief and they'd go to their sick friends and loved ones and they'd put that handkerchief on their sick friends and loved ones and people got healed. They did the same thing with the aprons that they took from Paul and not only that, they did the same thing to cast demons out of people. I remember as a kid uh, uh, hearing a guy on, on TV talking about a holy hanky and uh, he was on uh, uh, TBN or something like that and he said, for $15.99, you can get this prayer hanky that I literally prayed over and it can be yours and I have a few of these. I have 1,000 of these. I'm sure he used all 1,000 of those to pray over. And I thought to myself, even as a kid that didn't know Jesus Christ, I thought, how many people are falling for this stuff? 
Now, Paul, the situation there was legitimate. And God did a wonderful thing. There were miracles, indirect miracles. There were miracles, uh, direct miracles. And then we see there was a miracle of separation. Now, exorcism was big business in a place like Ephesus. Why? Because it was a place of darkness. So the Bible tells us that they were tra- there were traveling Jews who had an attachment to the Jewish temple and had come to Ephesus to ply their trade of exorcism. Notice the account. It says there were certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, and they took upon them to call over those which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches, and there were seven sons, one of Sceva, a chief, a Jewish chief of the priests, which did so. So Sceva and his sons, they didn't know Jesus personally, but they invoked Jesus' name, the, the Jesus who Paul preaches, and, 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 and here's what happens. They, they knew the uniqueness uniqueness and power that came from Jesus. And notice here it says, and the evil spirit answered and said, imagine this, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who in the world are you? (laughs) Imagine the ego of these supposed exorcists. But not only that, imagine this taking place. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I can only imagine our staff, uh, after uh, seeing something like this, our, our staff that meets on Monday for our staff meeting, and we gather around our, our conference table, and, and we talk about the goings-on of the weekend, and we, we, we just happen to be there at, at this incident where the sons of Sceva try to cast out the demon out of this man, and we're all watching that go down and seeing how it doesn't work. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who are you? And we're sitting at the conference table. Did you see that? Man, what a dummy. He thought he could make some money by by invoking the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. He didn't even preach. Sceva didn't even preach about Jesus and didn't even know Paul. And here he is invoking Jesus and the demon know who really reigns. The demon know that Jesus was king. (laughs) What a dummy. I could see us laughing about something like that. I can imagine the church doing the same thing. The evil spirit in this stronghold of darkness recognized the power and authority of Jesus but brought pain to these false followers of Jesus and as a result of this, the gospel, Paul's teaching and other miracles God allowed, the Bible tells us, and this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling at Ephesus, and fear, respect fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now the light of the gospel was shining. Jesus was magnified in this dark place of Ephesus. The power and light of Jesus was showing through. God was allowing miracles to take place. And as more people received Jesus, their light was piercing this this darkness in this stronghold in Asia Minor. And God allowed miracles of life change. Now notice the Bible says, and many that believed came and confessed and they showed their deeds. And many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, back in this day, a piece of silver was a day's wage. You would make, as a day's wage, one piece of silver. Now, people believed They confessed their wrongs to God. They confessed their wrongs to one another. They openly repented from living in darkness. They turned from their unrighteousness and to Jesus. And people that were involved in necromancy or worship of false gods and demons brought their paraphernalia and their books and they had a good old-fashioned book burning time. Now, they could have sold them. They could have given their books away. But these people now who had the light of Christ and were no longer in darkness didn't want to go back and they didn't want anybody else to be ensnared in that darkness. So they burned away 50,000 days' worths 
of wages or 136 years of wage labor because they were new and they were changed people. And the Bible tells us, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, most people believe that as a result of God's ministry through Paul in Ephesus, the seven churches of Asia Minor mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 were started. God used the gospel witness here to spread to Smyrna, which was nearby, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and another place that is not mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, the city of Colossae. God's word grows when the gospel is clearly presented and people receive it. And when this happens, there's always life change. This historic satanic stronghold was changing into a lighthouse from which the light of the gospel would shine all throughout Asia. Jesus changed people and Jesus even changed a population. And let me say this this morning, Jesus can change you. Jesus can change you. Now, if you've never been saved, you can, as the Bible says of the Thessalonians, turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. You can turn from your sin. You can turn from your unbelief. You can repent of that and turn to Jesus by faith and receive his offering of himself for you on Calvary's cross. You can be saved. If you are saved... You can, with God's help, conquer those strongholds that have captivated you. Lust, pornography, bitterness, anger, resentment, hurt, pride, disappointment. Whatever the stronghold may be, God can give you the victory. Here in Ephesus, that's what he did. God turned a satanic stronghold into a place that propagated the light. God can turn a stronghold, a fortress of the devil, a fortress the devil has in your life into a place of life. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, notice what he says, past tense, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered of you, being then made freed from sin, you have become the servants of righteousness. I know at times you don't feel like you're free. I know at times you feel like you're in bondage. I know at times you feel like you can't get rid of that thing that's in your life, but let me explain something. You, if you know Jesus Christ, as your savior you are free you're free but you got to believe it here's what it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 it says likewise reckon now if I were to live in the south and I said I reckon I'm going to go to the store I would mean I think I guess I might but when the Bible says, likewise reckon, it means to count it as true. To take it to the bank, if you will. And here's what it says, likewise reckon or count it as true, yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now, you know what? Lust doesn't affect a dead man. Anger doesn't affect a dead man. Disappointment doesn't affect a dead man. And you by faith have to realize that that sin that has been a stronghold in your life is dead to you. It says you have to believe that you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the same faith that you exerted to be saved is the same faith that is going to keep you and the same faith that is going to give you victory over the strongholds that beset you in your life. So my question to you this morning is, what strongholds need to be burned in your life?
had a family member that when they got saved, they had some paraphernalia, the Book of the Dead, a Ouija board, several other things. And they gave them to me and they said, I'm no longer beholden to these things. They no longer have power over me anymore. And I want you to get rid of them for me. And I was just a teenager. I was saved for several years and I knew some things, but I didn't even want to touch them. And when I grew up in Michigan, we had a burn pile. I don't think you can have burn piles here in Arizona because, I mean, you burn something and everything else burns, right? You know, in Michigan, everything's wet, so you don't have to worry about everything catching on fire. But we had a burn pile, and I put the, all these things on our burn pile, and I doused them with gas. And by the way, if you ever see a gas can and see a box of ma matches in my hand, just walk away, okay? Stand away. <laughs> I'm likely to burn my eyebrows off and your eyebrows as well, okay? And maybe catch us both on fire. So I, I doused that thing with gas. I had some matches. I threw the matches on the, uh, on the, on the, the burn pile on top of the stuff, and the gas burned, but the paraphernalia didn't burn. Started getting the little hairs going up on the back. Started quoting scripture. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Quoted 1 John, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I quoted Peter where it says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith and that gas continued to be burning but the pile the books and the paraphernalia was not burning and all of a sudden there was a and it started to burn and I guarantee you every hair on my body was standing up when that thing went down we don't think there are strongholds today. But I guarantee you, if there's a sin that we're struggling with, the devil and his minions are making it available and putting it before us and using our reticular activating system so that we see it, we think about it, we consume it. It's always before us. So what strongholds in your life need to be burned. You see, the Ephesians didn't need their strongholds anymore. They had something more in Jesus. And I want you to understand, you don't need your stronghold anymore. Let Jesus burn them. We see the gospel had so affected Ephesus that there ended up being mayhem. There ended up trouble, ended up coming. And we see first there was an accusation against Paul and the Christians. Notice the Bible says, and at the same time there arose no small stir about the way. Now historians agree that most people refer to Christianity at this time as the way. And here at Ephesus, some people became unsettled about the way. And many scholars believe that during this time, the Feast of Artemisia, uh, which was a month-long feast in, ardor of, in honor of the goddess Ar Artem Artemis, uh, Diana of the Ephesians, and so the turnout was meager compared to previous years, and so people began to be unsettled. And the Bible tells us a certain man by the name of Demetrius, a silversmith, which had silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, sirs, you know that by this craft we have made our wealth. We've made a lot of money off of Diana of Ephesus. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost all throughout Asia, uh, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Now, Demetrius was one of those who became unsettled. And he gathered his union together down at the local 666. And he said to the artists, to the sculptures, to the priests, to the priestesses, to the smiths, and to the prostitutes, hey, 
We used to make a lot of money plying our trade here. But now this upstart by the name of Paul is teaching people so thoroughly that they have come to this conclusion that there are no gods made with hands and people no longer are coming to our shops, they're no longer coming to our tables, they're no longer coming to our parlors, and we are losing money. If we don't change something, we're going to go out of business. Then Demetrius implies that Paul is destroying the city and he is trying to turn his losses that would have not affected everyone into a matter of civic pride and nationalism. So he's trying to stir the crowd up, trying to get anger uh, going. And notice what the Bible says, so that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And Then a riot ensues. Notice the Bible says, and when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city uh, was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rush with one accord into the theater. This is the theater that still stands there today. There's my lovely wife. There's a picture. Think about this. It's 25,000 seats. Now, I'm told that as recently as uh, last year, uh, uh, like Andrea Bocelli sang there. Can you imagine him singing Time to Say Goodbye with the acoustics of this theater? Time to say goodbye. I'm not going to (laughs) try. You will say, it's time for me to say goodbye, Pastor. (laughs) 25,000 people chanting for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. There's confusion. There's, there's uh, mayhem. I mean, you could hear the voices of 25,000 people shouting that all the way out to the sea, which you can see in the distance, and probably across the sea all the way into neighboring Smyrna and Thyatira and Pergamos and and Laodicea and Aeropolis and Colossae, you could hear 25,000 people roaring. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Who knows what would happen? Maybe they would start burning things. Maybe they'd start killing people. Maybe the Romans would come in and inject themselves with legions of soldiers because the city could not keep control. And so that's what was about to go down. And so the crowd is settled. Notice the Bible says in verse uh, 35 that a town secretary, the prominent uh, prominent non-Roman official, he implores the city, he says, and when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Jupiter? And and he he goes through this whole scenario and says, hey, listen, we're in danger of, of Rome coming in and being here for good and imposing more laws and imposing more taxes, settle down or we're going to be the worst for the wear. If you have a problem with what's going on, take it to the courts and deal with that. And notice what it says in verse 41. It says, and when he had thus spoken, he dismissed this assembly. So everything got settled down. God protected Paul when he was at Corinth. God protected Paul in Ephesus and God gave Paul a wonderful ministry. Again, the ministry was so effective that the Bible tells us all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Miracles were happening. Life change was happening. People were turning from their unrighteousness and turning to Jesus. And the Bible says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Strongholds were being torn down. The gospel made a dent in the evil that was so pervasive at this time. And Ephesus, and let me say, the gospel does the same thing today. So my question again is, what strongholds does Jesus need to burn away in your life? What sin are you struggling with that no one knows about, that God has revealed to you, that you know needs to be burned by the eyes of Jesus Christ.